highlights today i will go over online teaching personal for zoology axidoc so last class we have started the coordination system the system responsible for integrating and synchronizing the various activities of the body we have two different coordinating systems one the chemical coordination another one the nervous coordination so we started the nervous coordination and also the various components of the nervous system or the neural system you know that one the neural system broadly classified into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system the central nervous system includes the brain and spinal cord so we talked about the various functional activities of the brain in the last class we have concluded also the four brain and the various components of the four brain and the functions and the last one we completed the role of hypothalamus the most important center not only controlling certain activities away from the central nervous system of the brain and spinal cord for example your thirst your hunger feeling full and also the regulation of sexual behavior various expressions your mood the excitement fear anger pleasure and other activities like motivations so in addition to this nervous activity the hypothalamus also secretes certain chemicals what are called hypothalamic hormones these hormones are responsible for regulating the various activities of another endocrine gland the master gland which is located in the brain a part of it and that is the pituitary gland so through its secretions hypothalamus also controls the activities of the master gland namely the pituitary gland so these are all some of the functions related to the hypothalamus now let us pass on to the second part of the brain the midbrain the mesencephalon it is also called mesencephalon or simply called as midbrain and if we are taking the midbrain region the roof of the midbrain region has four swellings that is why normally the midbrain is also called corpora cordigemina corpora cordigemina the four swellings are simply called as mounds the four swellings are simply called as mounds also called as colliculi also called as colliculi also called as colic so these mounds actually four in number two of them are superior in position and two of them are actually inferior in position accordingly they are named superior colliculi and inferior colliculi so together form corpora cordigemina so this is a nickname for the midbrain and normally this area is concerned with some visual reflexes for example you are listening to the lesson <coughs> listening to the lecture so all of a sudden you are hearing some music from outside so automatically involuntarily you are turning your head towards the direction this is called visual reflex so unknowingly unwillingly involuntarily unconsciously you are turning your head towards the direction and that is what is called involuntary act that is also an example for visual reflex and also this region is concerned with actually controlling the movement of eye and that means it is normally helping in tracking the moving objects tracking the moving objects for example you are just watching a tennis program a tennis game so you are sitting in a particular place but your eyes are going towards this direction and that direction to and from motion this is what is called visual tracking of moving objects even while you are watching a cricket when the ball is going just over the road while the person is eating six sir so the eye is moving towards that object along with it this is what is called visual tracking this visual tracking of moving object is because of the big drive and also this region is concerned with the hearing auditory response and also it is a visual like the visual response it is also actually a reflex activity you are listening to some music you are listening to some song away from you and conscious so anyway my brain is concerned with mainly sub reflex activities concerned with visual reflex as well as auditory reflex now the last part the hind brain what is called the rhombencephalon 
again divided into mesencephalon as well as metencephalon, sorry, uh, Roman cephalon, metencephalon and myelencephalon. That, that is a nickname for that one, in our about that one. So the hind brain, the most important part of the brain. Because if anything happens to other parts of the brain, you feel unconscious. But something happens to the hind brain, the person dies. Because the hind brain is the one which controls two important vital activities, namely the heartbeat rate and also the breathing. These are the two vital activities for survival. As something happens to the hind brain, immediately death occurs when compared with other parts of the brain. Now, this hind brain being formed of three components pons, cerebellum, and medulla oblongata. Pons, cerebellum, and medulla oblongata. Now, this part is actually the cerebellum region, and this is the pons, and this is the medulla oblongata. Pons, this actually this is the pons, this is medulla oblongata, and this part is the cerebellum. So these three components are responsible for doing some activities. Now let's see the various components and their functions. Suppose you see that one, the brain of human being is normally just like a question mark in shape. And it is being held by a stalk, the stem. That is called as a brain stem. The brain stem is actually formed by the pons, medulla oblongata, and also the midbrain. So the midbrain, pons, as well as medulla oblongata together form what is called the brain stem, the one which is holding, the one which is holding the brain. Okay, now let's come this later. So we have three components in the hind brain region: pons, cerebellum, and also medulla oblongata. Now the pons region. So it is normally considered as a relay center between the cerebrum and cerebellum. So you receive information from various parts of the body and convey the message to the cerebrum. cerebrum. Similarly, you receive information actually from the cerebrum and convey the message to other parts of the body. That's why it's called a relay sent receiving and then conveying the messages. And normally the pons is nothing but actually a sheet of nerve fibers or collection of nerve fibers even joining the two lobes of the cerebellum. The coordination of the various parts of the body, the two sides of the body, happening only when you have the cerebellar hemispheres are working together in a cooperative manner and for that we need the pons. The pons is responsible for joining the two cerebellar hemispheres to coordinate the muscular activities. Now what is the role of pons? We mentioned just actually it is a relay center. It normally relays the information between the cerebrum and other parts of the body, receive the information from the cerebrum and conveying the message to other parts of the body and also receive the information from various parts of the body and then conveying the message to the cerebrum. And in addition to this one, the pons also contain sleep centers and also breathing centers. So along with medulla oblongata, it is a main center for breathing. It is also taking part in controlling the breathing process. So pons, in addition to act as what is called a release center, it is also responsible for coordinating the breathing movements along with medulla oblongata. Then, cerebellum. So, I mentioned earlier, cerebellum is normally responsible for the muscle coordination, the balance, the muscle tone, etc. The maintenance of posture. So, you have, for example, if you remove the cerebellum, that condition is called decerebellated condition. The animal doesn't show what is called proper movement. It shows what is called exact movement. The movement is not proper if the cerebellum has been removed. So, anyway, the cerebellum is responsible for mainly for regulating the various voluntary muscle activities. That is number one. Number two, it is also responsible for maintaining the posture and the balance of the body while a person is walking or running or even swimming. So at times of walking, running and swimming, the activity is being maintained and also it is keeping the body without falling over. That is what we call this one the balance and just making the air closer of the body. So all these being done because of the cerebral. Anyway, it is concerned with the precision of what is called the voluntary movements of the skeletal muscles. The voluntary actions are brought about by you know that one the skeletal muscles and that one is normally under the control of the cerebellum. Then, of all the parts I mentioned, the medulla oblongata is the most important region. 
I mentioned earlier, if even a small damage to medulla oblongata causes the death of the individual. Because it is considered as a center for reflex activity, a center for reflex activity. It controls most of the reflex activities in the body. Again, it is at least a conduction pathway between conduction pathway between the brain and the spinal cord. So all the messages have been transformed or transported from the spinal cord towards the brain only through the middle of the That is why it's called as a conduction pathway for ascending and descending nerve tracts and also acts as what is called a reflex center. So it contains a number of nuclei. Whenever we are using the word nuclei in nervous system that refers to nothing but a collection of gray matter collection of gray matter or we can say collection of that is what is called the cell bodies of the nerve cells and now it contains reflex centers which regulate the various activities for example the heartbeat rate the cardiovascular functions so your heartbeat rate is actually you know that one involved in nature taking place according to the situations according to your activities and it is also a center for breathing Breathing center is mainly located in medulla oblongata along with addition center in the pons what I mentioned earlier. And also it is center for swallowing. So if anything happens in the medulla oblongata, you cannot have the ability of just actually taking the foot inside. The swallowing center is located in medulla oblongata. Then the center for vomiting, the center for coughing, the center for sneezing. So all these activities are reflex activities. So that's why we can say the middle oblongate is concerned with all reflex activities, vomiting, swallowing, breathing, sneezing, all activities are involuntary activities. That is why we are considering those activities as reflex activities. Now this middle oblongate along with the midbrain also forms what I mentioned the brain stem to just to hold the cerebrum. But actually the brain stem is formed of the midbrain. And only two components of the hindbrain normally take part in the formation of brain stem, namely one pons and medulla oblongata. The cerebellum is not taking part in the formation of brain stem. The brain stem is mainly formed of the midbrain, and then the two components of the hindbrain, namely the pons and medulla oblongata, together form a brain stem, the stalk which holds the cerebrum. So these are all some of the components of the brain. And also we have a number of functional areas in the brain. So altogether, if we are taking the total brain, so you have the cerebrum, it forms two thirds of the total volume of the brain, and it is being formed of two cerebral hemispheres, what I mentioned. And each cerebral hemisphere is apparently, not actually, apparently divided into four loops. Now this is what we call this one the frontal loop, and this one is called as the lateral loop, and the roof is formed of the parietal loop. And the back is formed of occipital loop. So this is number one at the front side, front loop. Number two, it is a lateral loop. Number three, this is what is called the parietal loop. And number four, at the back you have occipital loop. So this is because of the presence of certain sulcus. Sulcus, the shallow roots. Fissures, the deep roots. So we have normally in the brain motor areas, sensory areas and also associated areas what I mentioned earlier. So the motor areas are mostly abundant in the frontal lobe region concerned with the muscular activity. So your voluntary activities, the hand movement, etc. And also you have the area in the frontal lobe named the speech area, also called Broca's area. You can able to speak because of this area formed in the frontal lobe, particularly just at the base of the frontal lobe. So you can be able to hear sound. That area is called auditory area. See that one, this is concerned with hearing. That is nothing but the superior part of the temporal. And you can be able to see the various objects because of the lobe, what is called the occipital lobe, and that is called as the visual area. So according to the functions, we have different areas in the brain, motor area, speech area, hearing area, also, we have the smell, the area of smell is located here. And your memory, your intelligence, your language, all being located in the parietal lobe. So, we have sensory areas receiving information from various sense organs, particularly from the skin. So, this area is the sensory area. 
And likewise, this is the motor area concerned with motor activities. So this is the area for cutaneous sensation, receiving, for example, the information regarding the touch, pressure, pain, etc. So that is why it is given sensory area, touch and pressure. And also we have the area for taste. That is also a kind of sensation you are received from the tongue region. So you can have the ability of actually memorizing the language and also just reading everything, recognizing the individual, what is called the face recognition, all being localized mainly in the parietal lobe. That is the superior lobe is called parietal lobe. And you can see the various objects only with the occipital lobe, the fourth lobe, and that is the area for vision. So you will be getting more and more, so I have given only a few things only. You will be getting more information about the brain and their functions and also the various function areas while you are coming up to higher classes. This is up to 11, though it is not included in the syllabus. You have to know something about the functional activities of the different parts of the brain. Okay, sensory area, motor area, speech area. Then we have the sensory area for smell, area for taste, area for vision, area for hearing. So, each area is localized in the cerebral region. So, that is a vast area controlling most of the voluntary activities. But the areas concerned with involuntary activities are localized mainly in the middle of the area, what I mentioned earlier, controlling the vital activities. Now, so we have the brain. We have to protect the brain because it is the main coordinating center, the commanding center, controlling center of almost all the activities. So if anything happens to the brain, then you feel unconscious, we are leading to what is called the coma state. So in order to protect the brain, we have certain structures. So normally the brain is enclosed within a bony cavity, what is called the brain box or cranium. So the brain box is also called as cranium. So generally we can say the skull. The skull is found up, you know that the bones just all together. That is 14 facial bones and then 8 cranial bones along with just we have the ear possible 3 plus 3 like that. Just the 28 bones are formed in the head region. So the bones of the head collectively calls a skull and part of the skull which encloses or which accommodates the brain is called as a brain box or cranium. The entire just head region is called as a skull. And the box which holds or which accommodates the brain is called as a cranium or the brain box. This is one protection. Then another protection inside the brain, sorry, inside the skull region or inside the brain box, the cranium. Normally the brain is enclosed by means of three membranous coverings, connected tissue coverings. And these connected tissue coverings are called cranial meninges or simply the meninges. So the meninges are nothing but connected tissue membranes covering the entire central nervous system that is both brain and spinal cord. So if you are taking the brain, see that one. So this is, these are all the coverings lying over each other and above each only we have the bone. This is the bony skeleton. This is what is happening. So the entire central nervous system is enclosed by the skull bone on the brain box. And below which we have three membranous coverings. These membranous coverings are called meninges. The membranes are named from outer to the interior. The outer membrane is called as a dura mater. This is what we call this one dura mater. Outer protective membrane is called dura mater. The middle one is called arachnoid. The middle one is called arachnoid. This is the middle membrane. The innermost one which is lying close to the brain, lying on the surface of the brain, is called as a pia mat. Pia mat. Not matter, pia matter. So we have three connected tissue membranes, colored to call as meninges, from outer to the interior, outer dura matter, then arachnoid membrane middle, and then innermost one is called as a pia mat. So these are all the membranes protecting actually the brain. And not only these membranes, actually this is first protection by the bony structure. The second one just actually by the membrane structures. And also, the brain is contained in a fluid-filled balloon-like structure. That is, between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter, this is a space. Between the pia matter and the arachnoid membrane, there is a space. That is called as a sub-arachnoid space. 
That space is filled with a fluid. What is called CSF? The space is filled with a fluid. What is called CSF? Cerebrospinal fluid. So, and this one is also providing further protection to the brain by absorbing extra shock that is given to the brain while we are just noting the head, while the head moves. So there are three protection, one by the solid, namely the bony skeleton, another one by the membrane structures, namely the meninges, the third one in the form of fluid, what is called cerebrospinal fluid, and that is being present just normally between the pia matter and what is called the arachnoid membrane in the space, what we call this one the subarachnoid space. That is why just even I given the notes in that form. So the brain is contained in a fluid filled balloon like structure. So as we have the fluid outside, even during the development you know that one, the fetus is being surrounded only with the fluid. When compared to the solid and membrane structures, the fluid medium can have the ability of actually absorbing the extra shock. So they are acting as a shock absorber. That is why the brain is protected not only by the bony structure, not only by the membrane structures, but also a fluid medium namely the cerebrospinal fluid. This fluid is present not only in the space, what is called subarachnoid space, outside the brain. It is also formed inside the brain because the brain is somewhat a hollow cavity having some spaces, what are called ventricles. So the ventricles of the brain and also we have some sort of canal in the spinal cord, what is called spinal canal and that one is also filled with the cerebrospinal fluid. So we have the fluid present outside and inside the central nervous system just for maintaining the pressure the balance equally on either side of the brain inside and outside for the normal functioning of the brain so we are talking about only the protection to the brain so one by the skeletal structure another one by the three membrane structures a third one by the fluid medium namely the cerebrospinal fluid present in the subarachnoid space of actually just the membrane structures acting as what is called a shock absorber, a fluid medium, just a balloon like structure filled with fluid. So, you see that what the human brain is well protected by the skull, the first one. The second one, we have the meninges. There are three meninges outer dura matter, middle arachnoid, and the inner pia matter. The middle one is called arachnoid membrane, not matter. So, inside the box, I mentioned the brain is contained in a fluid balloon like structure which absorbs shock further. Now, so the nervous system is actually responding to the various activities. How does the nervous system work? So on receiving the information, we talked about the reflex activity already. While a person is touching a hot object, he is taking away the hand, that is what is called the sensory stimulus. If any sensory stimulus which brings about involuntary act, then it is called the reflex act. But normally, we are doing some voluntary actions. Most of the activities are only the voluntary activities. And these activities are controlled by the brain. Suppose a muscle wants to move. So we are walking. This is what is called the motor activity or the muscular activity. Or we want to take some book from the table. It is also called as a motor activity or a muscular activity. So want to, want to do that activity. Now the information is carried to the brain in the form of sensory root. So the sensory root of either spinal cord, that is named the spinal nerve, or the cranial nerves from the brain, they conduct the impulses to and from the organ, the one which does the action, namely the effector organ. The one which does the action is called effector organ. So most of the organs in the body are effector doing the activity. Say an example, muscle is an example of effector organ. Gland is an example for effector organ. Now how does an action being carried out? You see that one on receiving the information from the muscle through the sensory nerve. Immediately the brain sends information to the muscle. Making it to move. So this is step number one. So on receiving the information from the organ concern, namely the receptor organ or any other organ, the brain immediately sends information in the form of electrical impulses through the nerves, what we call this one the now impulses, to a particular muscle. Now the impulses reach the muscle. 
So what will happen? We have neuromuscular junction. A junction between the nerve fiber and the muscle is called neuromuscular junction. So because of release of neurotransmitters, now the muscle is stimulated. So as a result, what will happen? The muscle, you know that when it is nothing but a bundle of muscle cells or muscle fibers. Muscle cells are otherwise called as a muscle fibers. So the muscle fibers actually, they move, they become shortened by changing their shape. So there is a change in shape, ultimately the muscles become short. That is nothing but the contraction. That is responsible for doing muscle activity. So a nerve impulse from the brain reaches the muscle and making the muscle cells to change its shape and so that the muscle shortens. How does a change occur in the muscle fiber? So normally the change in the muscle fiber is caused because of some change in shape and arrangement of muscle proteins. If you are changing skeletal muscle, the muscle contains, you know, that muscle fibers or the muscle cells. In the muscle cells or muscle fibers, we have some more subunits, what are called myofibers. And if you are taking the myofibers, the myofibers are made up of ultimate electromicroscopic, what are called thin filaments and thick filaments. So, these are all the components found in a muscle. Muscle, muscle cells. In each muscle cell we have myofibrils and the myofibrils are actually made up of thick and thin filaments and these thin filaments and thick filaments are made up of two types of protein the contracted proteins namely actin and myosin actin and myosin so these are the two contracted proteins actin and myosin are the two contracted proteins and immediately these proteins change their shape so there is a change in the arrangement of such proteins also in the muscle cells. Change in shape and arrangement of the muscle. Some chemical reactions are taking place. We will be studying more about uh, the contraction of the muscle fiber in a sliding filament hypothesis in higher classes. I don't know touch now. So anyway, some changes are taking place in the muscle proteins. Change in shape and arrangement. And this is in response to the impulses received by the just what is called the nervous system. And as a result, you have new arrangement of these proteins. So we have the new arrangement of these proteins. Change in protein shape and arrangement that gives the muscle to short. That results in working of the just what is called the activity. The activity is being carried out in such a manner. So information is transmitted to the brain. The brain sends impulses to the muscle. The muscles change its shape and become shortened. And this change in shape is because of change in shape and arrangement of certain muscle proteins, what we call this one actin and myosin. And such a change or change in arrangement of such a proteins in the muscles to become strong. That results in contraction of the muscle so that the action has been carried out. So this is what we have a simple definition how far we are doing various activities. Now, the second component of the central nervous system we have the spinal cord. So you see that one, the brain, this actually the last part of the brain, the hind brain, we have what is called the inferior part, the inferior most part of the brain, inferior most part of the brain, what is called the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata has been continued as spinal cord. Medulla oblongata has been continued as spinal cord. So it is a tubular structure normally localized inside the vertebral column passing through the neural canal of the vertebral column, passing through the neural canal of the vertebral column. And so the spinal cord is being protected just inside the neural canal of the vertebral column. Actually, we have in the case of invertebrates, there are two double ventral nerve cords solid in nature. In contrast to the vertebrates including human beings, we have a single dorsal tubular nerve cord and that is otherwise called as a spinal cord. It is being placed inside the neural canal. That is one being formed by the continuity of the vertebral column as neural space by each vertebra. That is one. And normally, it is being protected by the same membranes, namely the meninges, just like the meninges of the brain. Just like the meninges of the brain. Now, if you are taking the brain, it shows two enlargement. Suppose you are taking actually. We are taking 
the spinal cord it shows two enlargements like this two enlargements so one in the neck region one in the neck region and that is what is called cervical flexus cervical this is what is called cervical flexus or cervical enlargement another one just in the nominal region what is called lumbar enlargement lumbar enlargement or lumbar flexus so the spinal cord exhibits two enlargement one in the neck region cervical enlargement another one in the lumbar region what is called lumbar enlargement lumbar enlargement so the terminal end normally it becomes swollen somewhat conical in shape somewhat conical in shape and that structure at the end of the spinal cord is called conus medullaris conus medullaris ends in a cone like structure what is called conus medullaris and beyond that one we have a filament structure formed by the meninges and that filament structure is called filum terminae this is what is called filum terminae a filament structure of the spinal cord filum terminate filum terminate so anyway normally just if you are taking the spinal cord a tubular structure two enlargements the conical structure at its end and also followed by a thin filament structure that is nothing but the continuation of the meninges meninges so resulting in a filament structure what is called filum terminate so and actually the spinal cord is about only 31 cm long and it runs only after the first lumbar vertebra so you know that one in the neck region 7 vertebrae and in the thoracic region we have 12 vertebrae and followed by we have 5 vertebrae in the lumbar region so it is running only after the neural canal of the first lumbar vertebra and beyond that level, the neural canal of the rest of the lumbar vertebrae normally filled with bunch of nerve fibers arising from the posterior end of the spinal cord. Posterior end of the spinal cord. Like this. The rest of the neural canal, the remaining neural canal, just after the first lumbar vertebra, the neural canal is filled with only a bunch of spinal nerves arising from the posterior end of the spinal cord which gives the appearance of a horse tail which gives the appearance of a horse tail and such a structure which is looking like a horse tail is called corda equina it's called corda equina corda equina so we have spinal cord terminal end corner structure cone like structure cornus medullaris then filament structure filum terminate and bunch of spinal nerves arising from the posterior end of the spinal cord giving the appearance of a horse's tail hence called corda equina corda means tail equus the scientific name of horse so this is the external morphology of uh, external morphology of the spinal cord let's see now about the internal organization so if you are taking the now this is the just the external morphology we have different areas corresponding to the areas to the vertebral column. You know that one in the vertebral column, you have the cervical area, thoracic area, the lumbar area, sacral area, and also coccygeal area corresponding to the just vertebral column regions. Here also we have the different regions. And I mentioned that it's a conus medullaris, the swollen structure. And now this is what is called the corner echina. This is nothing but bunch of spinal nerves arising from the spinal cord giving the appearance of a hostage. Now, this let us take the internal organization. So, if you make a cross section of the spinal cord, you can see the following structures. Normally, in cross section, the spinal cord even just right away on the external morphology, you can see on the dorsal side as well as on the ventral side, there are certain depressions or grooves. So, on the dorsal side, which is also considered as a posterior side, the dorsal side is also called as a posterior side, then the ventral side is also called as an anterior side. So, on the dorsal side running throughout the spinal cord, on the mid dorsal line, there is a narrow groove or sulcus. Narrow groove or sulcus. 
This is what is called actually dorsal fissure or actually posterior fissure. And on the ventral side we have a deep and that is what is called anterior fissure. As it is localized on the mid central line, this is what is called median fissure. So on the ventral side we have a fissure, a furrow, deep in nature and that is what is called anterior or ventral median fissure. On the dorsal side we have a shallow groove and that is what is called the posterior or dorsal fissure. Now if you analyze the nature of the spinal cord internally, it is being formed of two regions. You see that one, the colored blue is what is called a gray matter region. And the white, this is what is called white region. Outer white matter and inner gray matter. So the spinal cord is actually formed of outer white matter and inner gray matter. So normally the outer white matter is formed of medullated neurons. Medullated neurons, the one which is having myelin sheet. Because of that one it is white in color. Because the medullary sheet is a fatty layer which is white in color. So outer white matter made up of medullated neurons and inner grey colored substance what is called grey matter which is being formed of non-medulated neurons neurons without fatty layer without medullary sheet that's why it is grey in color so normally the white matter is arranged in the form of columns or funiculus see that one the form of column or funiculus so this is dorsal white column ventral white column lateral white column like that so likewise the grey matter it is being arranged in the form of the alphabet H. It's being arranged in the form of alph alphabet H. You see that one. It's in the form of alphabet H. So accordingly, it has dorsal grey horn, lateral grey horn, and ventral grey horn. Dorsal, ventral, and lateral grey horn. Some projections. And in the center of the grey matter, we have a canal. What is called the spinal canal or central canal. And that canal is filled with what is called the cerebrospinal fluid. The same fluid what is present in the cavities of the brain. So the spinal canal is nothing but the continuation of uh, the ventricles of the brain. That is why we have the ventricles, the bright cavities as well as the central canal, the cavity of the spinal canal filled with the same fluid, cerebrospinal fluid. So that is about the internal organization of the spinal cord. Just to be hung. See, it is a narrow dorsal fissure also called as posterior fissure on the mid dorsal side and a deep ventral fissure on the mid ventral side or anterior side. And now in the center of the spinal cord is a central canal filled with cerebrospinal fluid, what I described earlier. Then, so we have the gray matter. The gray matter is formed of non-medulated neurons. Because of the absence of medullary sheet or fat layer, it becomes gray in color. And the outer region is formed of medullated white neurons, provided with medullary sheet or fatty layer or myelinated neurons. Then, what is the role played by the spinal cord? So, it acts as a conduction pathway between the brain and various organs of the body. And through its nerves, it conducts impulses from the various organs towards the brain and similarly carries information from the brain to different parts of the body. So, it is acting as a conduction path, conduct impulses to and from the brain. And secondly, so all reflex activities, what we studied earlier, originated, just actually take place only in the spinal cord. So it is a center for reflex activity. So when a person is sleeping, when the brain is not walking at times of sleep, the various activities are looked after mainly by the spinal cord. That is why. We are not waking up even when a mosquito is coming and biting you. And what will happen? We are scrapping without waking up. This is because of the reflex activity controlled by the spine. So, when the brain is taking rest at times of sleep, the reflex activity and other activities are controlled mainly by the spinal cord. So, it is a center for reflex activity. One, a conduction pathway. Another one acting as a reflex center for regulating and controlling the reflex activities of the body. Now, so we have actually studied about the various components present in the mid central axis of the body. They together form the central nervous system including the brain and spinal cord. 
Now, from the brain as well as from the spinal cord, we have a number of nerves arising. And they together represent the peripheral nervous system as they are moving towards the peripheral parts of the body. So, these are all the nerves moving towards the peripheral parts of the body, either from the brain or from the spinal cord. Now, this is the brain and this is the spinal cord. And those nerves arising from the brain and spinal cord, deviating from the central nervous system, moving towards the peripheral organs, together constitute PNS, the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system includes nerves arising from the brain, simply called as the cranial nerves, and nerves arising from the spinal cord, together called as the spinal nerves. So there are twelve packs of cranial nerves arise from the brain. For example, olfactory. Optic, oculomotor, trochlear, yes, we have trigeminal, we have abducens, facial, like that, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, unlike the frog. In the case of frog, only 10 pairs of cranial nerves, 10 pairs of cranial nerves in frog, but in the case of reptiles, birds, and mammals, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Reptiles, birds, and mammals, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. In the case of frog, only we have 10 pairs of so that is about what we have, those nerves arising from the brain together constitute the cranial nerves, there are 12 parts of cranial nerves. Some of the nerves are sensory, carrying sensory information, for example, olfactory nerve. It carries a sensory stimulus from the nose towards the brain. The optic nerve, it carries the information from the eyes towards the brain, carries only sensory information. And some are motor, for example, oculomotor. The now which controls the movement of the muscles, oculomotor, or for example, the eleventh cranial nerve, hypogloss, sorry, spinal accessory, or twelfth cranial nerve, hypogloss. They are carrying the impulses towards the muscles, hypogloss, and to the tongue, like that. So some nerves of the brain, the cranial nerves, are sensory, some are motor, and some are mixed. For example, vagus nerve, one nerve, the tenth cranial nerve. It carries actually information, just both motor information as well as sensory information. It's a mixed now. Trigeminal now. It is also a mixed now. So like that we have the cranial nerves are either sensory or motor or mixed. Then about the spinal nerves, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves in the case of human beings. But in the case of frog, we have 10 pairs of cranial nerves. So sorry, 10 pairs of spinal nerves. So, 10 pairs of cranial nerves and 10 pairs of spinal nerves in the case of frog. But in the case of human being, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves and then 31 pairs of uh, just a spinal nerves. They together constitute just what we call this one, the peripheral nervous system. So, we have the peripheral nervous system which includes what I mentioned, the cranial nerves, 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And then we have also 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And normally, the cranial nerves are either sensory or motor or mixed type. Sensory, motor or mixed. Whereas the, all the spinal nerves, 31 pairs of spinal nerves are only mixed nerves. That means carrying both sensory and motor information. Inside they have motor root and then sensory root. So all the spinal nerves are mixed nerves. Whereas the cranial nerves are either sensory or motor or mixed. Then, suppose you take a, a spinal nerve, how is it formed? Normally the spinal nerves are arising from the lateral sides of the spinal cord. Now this is the lateral side of the spinal cord. And each spinal nerve, this is a spinal nerve. And each spinal nerve is actually formed by the union of two root. One is present on the dorsal side and this is what is called as the dorsal root. And this one is called as the ventral root. The dorsal root is also called, I mentioned already, the posterior one. The ventral one is also called as the anterior root. So a spinal nerve is actually formed by the union of two roots. One is the dorsal root attached to the dorsal end and another one ventral root attached to the ventral side of what is called the spinal cord. That is why and the two roots join together to form a single spinal nerve. The dorsal root, this is made used by the sensory nerve. So the information is normally carried the information is carried towards the spinal cord through this dorsal root. That is always called a sensory nerve root. 
and the information from the brain or spinal cord is sent out to the ventral route. So it carries what is called the motor nerve. So the dorsal route is a passage for the sensory nerve and the ventral route is a passage for motor nerve. So likewise the information is normally carried into and out of the central nervous system. So anyway spinal nerve is formed by the union of a dorsal and ventral route together to form a single spinal nerve, a mixer nerve carrying both sensory and motor information. So in addition to the peripheral nervous system, we have also an independent nervous system. It is not working under the control of the brain or spinal cord. It works independent. So it is an autonomous body. That is why it is called as autonomic nervous system. So this is an independent nervous system, not under the control of uh, the brain or spinal cord. It is working independently, but makes use of the roots of the spinal nerves as well as the cranial nerves for their reach to different parts of the body. So this autonomous nervous system or autonomic nervous system is now working in an antagonistic way to two sets of nerves. If one nerve accelerates one activity, another nerve just decreases its activity. This is what is called antagonistic action. Antagonistic action that refers to opposite action. For example, if you are just even in the case of muscles for folding, that is what is called the fluxing arms. We have one muscle, the upper arm muscle, the contraction. What is called the biceps muscle? On the lower side, we have what is called a triceps muscle. These muscles are working in an antagonistic way or in an opposite way. When one is contracting, another one is relaxing. This is what is called antagonistic act. Likewise, the two nervous, actually the two components of this autonomic nervous system, one is accelerating an action. Another one is suppressing or inhibiting or reducing the action of a particular organ. For example, one increases the salivation, secretion of more saliva. Another one suppresses the secretion of saliva. One normally just actually causes a peristaltic movement, the movement of the esophagus to just push the foot downwards towards the stomach that is called peristalsis. One just produces a peristaltic activity, another one normally suppresses a peristaltic activity. This is what is happening. So, an autonomic nervous system is an independent nervous system. It carries its activities through two different nerve fibers or systems which are working in an antagonistic way. One is called the sympathetic nervous system, another one what is called the parasympathetic nervous system. The nerves are called sympathetic nerves and parasympathetic nerves, respectively. So, what is the role of this autonomic nervous system? It controls the involuntary activities of the organs. For example, the cardiac muscle, the smooth muscle activity, and also the glandular secretions. So, these are all working independently. So, normally, it regulates activities of involuntary smooth muscles, the cardiac muscles, and also the glands. For example, Suppose, for example, the sympathetic nervous system, its branch accelerates the rate of heartbeat, whereas the parasympathetic nerves just normally decrease the rate of heartbeat. And for example, another one, the sympathetic nerves inhibits salivation, secretion of saliva, whereas the parasympathetic nerves actually accelerates salivation, the formation of saliva. And again, the parasympathetic nerves creates the peristaltic nerve. And that one sympathetic nerves actually inhibits the peristaltic nerve. And while we are just frightening, there is a dilation of the pupil. So the dilation of the pupil of the eye is caused by sympathetic nerves. The constriction of the pupil of the eye is caused by parasympathetic nerves. So both are working in an opposite way. One accelerates salivation. Another one decreases salivation. One accelerates the heartbeat. Another one decreases heartbeat. One causes the dilation of the pupil, another one causes the constriction of pupil. One causes the peristaltic movement of esophagus, another one just normally inhibits the peristaltic activities. Anyway, these involuntary activities like the activities of the smooth muscle, the cardiac muscle, the various glands to release their secretions or suppress their secretions are because of the activity of the autonomous nervous system through its two components which are working antagonistically. 
the various activities being controlled. So, so far we have studied actually the various components of the neural system. That is what is called one coordinating system, what we have the nervous coordination. And I would like to bring this chemical coordination after going through another chart. So, under the chemical coordination we have to go through the various endocrine plants. And before taking that chemical coordination, I would like to start another chart. We will complete that one for a change and then we will go back to the chemical coordination once again after finishing that chart. So, we have to just actually go to the next one. What we have? The microbiology. That is uh, human health and diseases. This is also another important chapter. You know that one nowadays we are accustomed to receive a number of disorders because of various uh, factors. Maybe because of mutations of genes or because of nutritional deficiency or because of some microorganisms. So we can't maintain a proper health. How to maintain a proper health? What do we make health? Whether it is at least simply without disease or it comprises of your physical health, mental health and also social health. So here we have to go through what is health, what are the dimensions of health, what are the different kinds of diseases, how are they caused. You know that once some of the diseases are caused because of microorganisms, then we can say the infectious diseases, for example cholera or tuberculosis. And some others are caused because of nutritional deficiency, for example vitamin deficiency. It's an example of dairy dairy, then rickets in the case of children. These are all nutritional deficiency disorders even Kosia, Kanmanasmus, etc. And also some disorders are genetic disorders. For example, one anemic condition, sickle cell anemia. Or you might have seen, for example, albinic persons having white colored skin. So these are all some of the disorders. How are they developed? How to prevent? How to keep our health in a better state? Now, first one about the health. What are the dimensions of it? What do you mean by health? So it is a state of actually a physical, mental and social well-being. Physical, mental and social well-being. It should be alright in these three dimensions. We are not alone physically well. Also, you should be mentally well and also socially well. So, a health is a state of physical, mental and social well-being and not mere an absence of disease or infirmity. So a person without a disease. So we cannot say such a person actually already healthy persons. He is having some sort of problems in his mind. He is crying, mentally upset. Or he is not socially well, not digesting with others, always quarrel with others. So a person is in good health only when these three dimensions are in optimum condition. It should be physically well, mentally well and socially well. These are all the three dimensions of health. That's why I say it is nothing but a state of physical, mental and social well-being. And not merely an absence of disease or infirmity. Now what do you mean by a physical dimension? How can you define it? Suppose I am saying that a person is physically well. The meaning for physical dimension is a person without any disease. Enjoying a regular metabolism, having a bright skin, lustrous hair, regular bowel movement without constipation. So all such activities together say that that person is physically well, without disease, enjoying good metabolism, bright skin, lustrous hair, regular bowel movement, regular urination without any obstruction. So all these things together a dimension for physical health. If you are without disease, we are saying that you are physically out. Now let's go to the second one, mental dimension. The person is actually mentally out. When? When he knows his capacities. I can do this one up to this level. I cannot do this one above this level. He knows his capacity. And again, he neither underestimate or over, nor overestimate himself. Don't think that you are superior. Don't think that you are also inferior. So he will neither normally overestimate nor underestimate himself. That is the second one. He can judge his what is called actually the shortcomings. One which is going to happen soon for him. 
and also his weaknesses, then only he can improve himself. He has to know his shortcomings, anything which is going to happen negatively, and also his weaknesses in a particular field, then how to overcome. Then only he is said to be mentally competent. First of all, he knows his capacities. He is not estimating actually over himself or underestimating himself. This is what we call this one mental dimension. Then what do you mean social dimension? So we are not adjusting the neighbors, always quarrel with somebody. This is what we can say, just defining a social marriage. A person is said to be socially alright when he is adjusting himself with the society, that is other people. And normally he is not finding fault with others, looking fault, always others. So he should adjust himself with the, with the society, that is with the people. And he is not finding fault with others. And he is also free from interpersonal conflicts. Conflicts will be him and his neighbor or actually other person. And will not quarrel with others in a society. So the main thing for what is called social dimension, he should be in a position to adjust with anybody at any time, in any place. Then only he said be socially ordered. So, Health is nothing but a state of all these three dimensions. If you are physically alright, mentally alright and socially alright, then we can say that person is actually a healthy person or a healthy individual. Now how to attain a good health? What are the factors necessary to achieve good health? You know that one, we need a good balanced diet. We not take much food. Take always according to the calorie values. That is what we have the balance by. The food should be taken in right proportion of proteins, carbohydrates and fats. That is what we can see the balanced diet. So a balanced diet is the one which contains different food materials in right proportion. And secondly, personal hygiene. You keep yourself clean. Generally, you cannot get the disease. That is what is called the personal hygiene. And then you have to do the exercise regularly to keep the body at least a minimum of 20 minutes of regular exercise to burn around nearly about 200 calories of energy. Then only will be alright. And the fourth one you have to know the various diseases, awareness. You have to know, you have to let you know. You normally let you know the various diseases, awareness about the various diseases. And what are their effects on different form, bodily functions? In what way they are affecting the different organs in the body, either the stomach or the heart or the brain, etc. So the awareness about what is called the different diseases, in what way they are affecting the different bodily functions. And you have to know the schedule of immunization and vaccination, when to give up the polio vaccine, when to give up the PCG vaccine, when to give the DPD vaccine. So he knows about the vaccination or immunization against the various diseases, when to give all these things. And also, you know that one, you have to avoid the pollution load, accumulation of waste. And for that one, we have to make proper disposal of waste, proper disposal of waste, to avoid the pollution load in a particular environment. That is what we can say slum clearance also. Then, normally the infectious diseases are transmitted from one person to another because of certain agents, such agents are called as vectors. Such vectors should be controlled, for example, the mosquito. We have three different types of mosquito responsible for transmitting malaria. One mosquito. Another one we have elephantiasis or phyleriasis. Another one you have the dengue fever, yellow fever. So these are all transmitted by the mosquitoes. And likewise the house flies which act as mechanical vectors for the transmission of diarrhea, dysentery, cholera, etc. So we have to control the vectors by various means, adapting measures to control vectors. And for everything, proper sanitation, that how can we? Maintain some just words of hygienic food and water. Always take up just a pure water, a hygienic food, the open food should not be taken from what is called the fast food items. The open food should be avoided. Anything which is kept open just all along the street should not be taken inside, should not be eaten. So that is what is called actually the maintenance of hygienic food and water. Always take one hygienic food and then water free from the infectious agent. So that means you are not supposed to take contaminated food and water. 
contaminated food and water, the one which contain the infectious disease. So these are some of the methods how to achieve what is called a good health. Balanced diet, personal hygiene, regular exercises, know about the various diseases and their effects on the bodily functions. Know about the vaccination and immunization schedule against various infectious diseases when to give all these things. And also disposal of waste. And also we have the control of vectors, the main agent responsible for the transmission of the diseases. These are all the transmitting agents, either mosquito or even for example, just we have the house flies which are called as the mechanical vectors transmitting most of the diseases. So we have a number of insect vectors, not only insect vectors but also the animals which transmit the disease. And finally we have to maintain the proper hygienic food and water form to be consumed. So these are all some of the things you have to just achieve in your life in order to maintain a good health. So health is affected by a number of factors and all these factors are grouped under three things. So the health may be affected because of what is called the genetic disorders or because of infections or when you are changing your lifestyle. For example, smoking, drinking, these are coming into the lifestyle, abuse of drugs, alcoholism. So, uh, health is affected by a number of factors and these factors are included under three headings. Genetic disorders or because of infections by the microorganisms or a post is changing his lifestyle. Smoking, drinking, alcoholism, abuse of drugs, etc. So we will continue about all these activities. What are the different kinds of diseases? How are they caused? In the forthcoming classes as the time has been complete. I am just concluding my part. And you have the right to ask any question relevant to this topic and I'll meet once again in the next class. Thank you. Now the class is complete.